Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord God, for the resurrection of your Son that has caused us to be born again into a living hope in heaven, undefiled. Thank you, Lord, for your sovereignty in all the matters that are taking place in this world right now that we know that you are totally in control and you are to be praised and glorified even in the midst of what we seem is a terrible thing. But knowing that you're in charge, Lord, should give us delight and honor. Be with us now as we go through the rest of this worship service. Help us to glorify your name forever and ever. For we ask all these things in your precious Son's name. Amen. Well, good morning. It is so awesome to be worshiping with you guys today. And if you are tuning in for the first time with East Newton Baptist Church, we welcome you. We would love to be able to see you, and shortly, we're not sure when, but shortly we will be gathering again on the premises. And I want to invite you to join us here one day when that day does come. A couple of announcements that we have. We are doing our Annie Armstrong offering, and we are at 3700 a little bit above that, so keep giving to that it will remain open through this month and guys as a staff we are following the guidelines of the state and the country on when we can get back together believe me that we want to believe me when I say we want to get together as badly as you guys do so Keep uh, paying attention to us and listening for when we are going to be getting back together. Enjoy the worship service. Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to Knowing the battles won For you have never failed me yet Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Your faithfulness I'm still in your hands, this is my confidence, you've never failed me yet. Your word will come to pass. My heart will sing your praise 
my heart will sing your praise again. Jesus, you're still enough. Keep me within your love. My heart will sing your praise again. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You've never failed. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faith. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never failed me yet. I've seen you move.
story You would hear freedom That was won for me If I told you my story Jesus, it draws me in, oh, to tell.
Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you give us the opportunity to serve you, to walk with you, to be in a close relationship with you. And the words to that song ring true in all of our lives. The longer we walk with you, the longer we serve you, the longer we grow in our understanding of who you are, the sweeter you grow to us. Father, your glory shines through in our lives more. Your character begins to take on new meaning every day in our lives. And Father, we become more and more like you. And Father, the sweeter you grow. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to sing praises of worship to lift up our hearts and our minds and our voices to you. We thank you, Lord, again for those who have been so faithful to come and and help record these services. Father, we thank you for each and every one. We pray, God, that you will just continue to watch over them, protect them, protect their families, and, Father, continue to bless their lives as they are faithful. Father, we thank you. And Father, as we enter into this time of studying your word, we pray, God, that you will give us some encouragement from your word, that you will give us some uh, greater understanding from your word, some growth in you, and Father, that you give us some rest in you. Father, we love you. And Father, we look forward to what you will teach us today in your word. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 
Well, this has been one of the most experience, uh, interesting times in my experience as a pastor. And I would even say strange times. I know that there are pastors who over the years have, have gone through other difficulties. In fact, even greater difficulties than we seem to be going through at this time thinking of things like the Spanish flu outbreak in 1918, World War II, Vietnam, uh, and then the uncertainty surrounding the events uh, of of 2001's 9-11. I would begin pastoring soon after this. I was in the ministry. I was doing youth ministry at the time, and that was a, a strange and interesting time. And I realized that we seem to be in a state of confusion, uh, in a state of longing. We, we long for interaction with other people. We long, I long for a handshake. Uh, that's one of the things I do hundreds of times a week, and, and now I can't shake hands. And uh, if I don't start shaking hands soon, I'm probably going to start going around and shaking the hands of the people in my house, and they'll probably get real tired of it. But we long to see one another. We long to be with one another. We long to study the Bible together. We long to worship together. We long for physical interaction and we miss it so dearly. Add to that that many have lost some financial stability through this. I recently heard of at least two people who have lost their jobs during this time. I know you've probably heard of some as well. Summer plans have been upended. We have canceled our trip to the Southern Baptist Convention and then uh, subsequently the trip to Disney World that we were planning at the same time. We don't know the future. Now, I don't know when we'll be able to meet together again. And I don't know that when we do begin to meet together again, how many people will be willing to come out that first Sunday. I know some will want to give it a couple of more weeks, those that have health problems already, and that's okay. We, we understand and we encourage you to do that. The last thing we would want to do is begin meeting and have some of our folks get sick. So we're being very diligent and faithful to to what God is calling us to do through the advice of our government leaders, uh, state leaders that tell us when we should begin to meet again and have placed some guidelines on how we go about doing this. We don't know the future, but we know the God who's in control of the future. We don't know the future, and I believe that in this time, while we're, we've been sheltering at home, spending more time at home than normal, not going about all the things that we normally do, I believe that we've gotten a little more physical rest than normal, a little more physical rest than we used to, but my friend, I believe we are still weary. We need physical rest in our lives to maintain uh, the rest we need to produce. We can't be effective at producing in this world if we don't get enough rest. That's why they tell children the night before a big exam, you need to get a good night's sleep because we need physical rest to be productive in our daily lives. But in the midst of spiritual and emotional struggles that we all are going through at this particular time and really every time in our lives, we need rest for our souls. We need rest that only comes from Jesus. Rest for our hearts. Rest for our emotional well-being. Rest for our spiritual growth. And so we are to live our lives with with a goal of striving daily to be holy. Striving daily to become more like Christ with a God centered devotion, a God centered worship, and a singular focus on seeking God first, as we said over the last few weeks. But we are pulled in so many directions as we are seeking God. 
We're pulled here with our work wanting us to do one thing, and we're pulled here with our family wanting us to do another, and we may have a problem with someone in our family being sick, and we may have a relationship problem with someone who does not want to get along with us. So there can be all these things that are pulling us in so many directions, and we simply lack the focus that we need on God to be effective for the kingdom of God. Add to that that we face a relentless and bitter struggle with the flesh. We are constantly being bombarded with ideas from the world and images from the world that want us to conform our lives to a worldly standard, all the while God is calling us to live for His standard. We mentioned last week that Satan is out prowling around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour, seeking to devour you. Temptation comes in every area of our lives, whether to study the Bible or watch a TV show, whether to love our neighbors or simply ignore them, whether to tell someone about Jesus or to pass them by as they carry on on their way to hell. So in the midst of this daily struggle, we must fight battles every day. So we learn from Scripture that fighting this battle that we face every day, facing these struggles to be pulled in so many different directions, we cannot fight the battle without Christ. If we do not lean on Jesus, if we do not allow and cooperate with the work of the Holy Spirit through our lives to help us face the struggles and the temptation, then we can be assured of nothing but failure. Today I want us to look at a text in which Christ addresses his followers and offers them an invitation to come. Come to Him and find spiritual and emotional rest. Find spiritual and emotional rest that that we so desperately need at this time in our lives and really at every time in our lives. Turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11 And I will ask you to please, wherever you are, stand as we honor the reading of God's Word. And God's Word says this. At this time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy." And my burden is light. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you, Lord, for the comfort and encouragement of it. And we pray, God, that you will, in this moment, help us, Lord, to learn from your word, to grow in your word, and to rest in your word. In the name of Jesus, we ask it. Amen. You may be seated. Today, I want us to look specifically at that invitation that says, come to me where Jesus says, come to me. But before we understand exactly what Christ is calling us to come to and exactly what Christ is calling us to do, we must understand the introductory words that he issues before he offers this invitation. And it helps us to understand the context. I've said it, uh, I'll say it again, context is king. 
Context is king. So to understand what the truth of Scripture is saying to us, we have to understand the context with which it was being said. And so these introductory words inform what the invitation is that Jesus is calling his people to. What he says is that all things have been handed over to Jesus, that that the Father knows Jesus and Jesus knows the Father, and that only the Father knows Jesus and only Jesus knows the Father. That is, only they can really truly ultimately know everything there is to know about each other. And then he goes on to say, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal it. What he's saying here is that the salvation of God's people is rooted in God's sovereignty. Every believer would do well to remember this when witnessing. During the last two years, I've been calling on each and every believer at our church to invite people to come and worship, invite people to our Bible studies and Sunday schools and events, and to share their faith with those who are lost. So how does the fact that that God is in control of all things and particularly that the the salvation of his people is rooted in his his sovereignty and his control and his understanding, how does that help us to witness? Well, since we know that God's plan is active and cannot be thwarted, we should remember that as we witness, he has promised results. (laughs) Amen? Listen, when we share our faith, not everyone will believe, but some will. We know it because God has promised it. And when we don't see results, even the most mean-spirited reply to our testimony should not discourage us. Even when somebody seeks to dishonor the name of God when you talk to them about Christ, and and we see it all the time in our world today, it should not discourage us because we know it is God that brings the increase, and we're simply called to plant the message and water it. God's going to do his work. We do our part and let him do the rest. And when people reject the message that you share with them, they are not rejecting you, they're rejecting Jesus. That's encouraging. And so as we look at Jesus' invitation this morning, we must remember that he is resting in the plan of God. This is a man who has come to this earth to die. He knows he's going to die soon. He knows what's going to happen. He knows the wrath of God is going to be poured on him, and yet he rests on the Father's plan and the Father's will. And he's praising God regardless of the circumstance that he will face. Then Jesus thanks God that he has hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. This is part of the context I was talking about. What are these things that he's talking about? Well, he's talking about the kingdom of God, the king of the kingdom, The subjects of the kingdom, our understanding of how the kingdom works. When he talked about parables, these are the things that the parables addressed, and he said that they are given to veil it from the the wise and understanding. Who are these wise and understanding that are really not wise at all? (laughs) The wise and understanding that he's talking about is people that are wise in their own estimation. They think more highly of themselves than they should, and they think they have all the answers to life. These can be both religious and non-religious people. People that believe there is a God are people that do not believe there is a God. They are simply wise in their own estimation. I believe all of us have a tendency to have this kind of self-centered arrogant thinking sometimes in our own lives so we have to be careful that we're not wise in our own estimation because pride goes before the fall right the means that God uses to hide the things of the kingdom from these people is their hard hearts and their blind eyes they are in darkness we find in scripture their hearts are being hardened their eyes are being blinded spiritual People understand spiritual things. The natural man cannot understand the things of God because he is blinded to them. 
The little children that God has revealed the kingdom to are not literal babies. We find out from Scripture that these are those who are humble in spiritual attitude. Spiritual babes are humble in spirit. They are the ones who acknowledge their utter spiritual helplessness before God. My friend, we would do well to acknowledge our utter spiritual helplessness before God. There's nothing in us, in and of ourselves, that we bring that's of any spiritual value to God. Our righteousness is as filthy rags before God. But God has chosen to reveal His kingdom to those who are poor in spirit, those who humble themselves before God and confess their utter dependence on Him. The contrast between these two groups is not a contrast between knowledge and ignorance, or the educated and the uneducated, or the brilliant and the simple-minded. It is a contrast between those who seek to save themselves or manufacture their own spiritual standing before God and those who realize that they are nothing without God. That's what Jesus is talking about before he says come. (laughs) That you can't save yourself. That you can't manufacture a spiritual standing before God. You have to realize that you are nothing without God and you become everything when he comes into your life. Not through your own might, not through your own abilities, not through your own understanding, not through your own spiritual prowess. But friend, when you realize you are nothing, then you can come to God and be something through him. Not only... Does Jesus reveal that it is babes, those who are humble, those who are poor in spirit that can come? He reveals the authority in which he can make this invitation. An invitation is only as good as the authority in whose invitation it comes. I could invite you to the White House, but I don't think you'd get in. But if the president were to invite you to the White House, then you could come because he has the authority to send the invitation. So why would this carpenter from Nazareth, born in Bethlehem, why would this lowly, humble person have the authority to bring this message to come to the Father, to come to him? Well, he calls God his Father So there he is claiming a divine nature. Not only is he God, but God has given all things over to him, he says. So I have the authority to make this invitation, Jesus is saying. Because he's king of kings and lord of lords, and he is the son of David that will sit on the throne of David forever and ever and ever. This is the context for which Jesus offers the invitation when he says, come to me. Now that we've got the context... uh, explained and understood, and now that you're experts on the context of this passage, we can move on. Come to me, he says. Rest in me, he says. Come to me, and and I will give you peace, and I will give you an abundant life that you've been craving. So let's look at this invitation. First, I'd like to look at the part of the invitation in which Jesus calls the lost to come. Jesus calls the lost to come. Just as man's part in salvation is to come in humility, he must also come in faith. So to be saved, you must first be humble, and you must also have faith. Although the yoke of salvation is easy, it sometimes can be hard to comprehend. And and it's not because it's hard to comprehend, it's because we make it hard to comprehend. We, We make it hard to comprehend because we try to add so many other things to it. God's sovereignty and the work in, in, and work in salvation is inseparable from human faith and responsibility. So God is doing a work here to initiate our salvation. God is doing a work here to convict us in the Holy Spirit. But then we have a human responsibility to humble ourselves before God and in faith come to Him as He calls us. So our faith and God's will to work These things go in concert with one another to produce salvation in the life of the believer. Salvation is not simply walking down the aisle 
We can't do that right now. Salvation is not simply coming to church and working hard uh, with the pastor to clean up your life. Salvation is not simply coming to Jesus in faith. He says, not just come, he says, come and believe. It's about Jesus. It's about a relationship with Him. It's about a walk with Him. This morning, I want you to know that Jesus is still issuing that call today. No matter what you're going through in your life, Jesus is still issuing that call today. He's calling people to come to Him for salvation. If you are listening today and you are lost, that is, you have never surrendered your life to Christ, the Bible teaches that you are without hope. The Bible teaches that you are destined for hell. The wages of sin is death. And Jesus is calling on you today to give up your own understanding, your own high knowledge, your own faith in yourself or faith in your works or faith in church attendance or faith in anything else and place your faith squarely in the only place that will do you any good on Jesus Christ. He's calling you to give up on yourself and call on Him. Acknowledge your sin. That is what repentance is all about. Repentance is simply turning away from your sin, recognizing that you're a sinner, recognizing the condition of your soul to be eternally separated from God, and repenting, that is turning away in true sorrow and placing your faith and trust in Christ. And he's calling you to come not only and believe, but to come hungering and you will be satisfied. Come desiring God and he will fulfill the desire of your longing for him. And then he reveals himself to you and you walk with him in a relationship at that point. Come, you who are lost, you who are outside the family of God. Come and be a part of the family of God. He's calling you today. We also see in our text that Jesus gives us some clarification as to the type of people that he's calling and drawing to himself. He gives some description, if you will. Jesus calls the weary and heavy laden. The condition that drives a person to Christ is a condition that already exists. The person that Jesus is calling is weary and heavy laden or laboring and heavy laden from the burdens of life in general and seeking to find salvation on their own. Seeking to get comfort and peace and rest on their own. And the condition exists because we are condemned already. From birth, we are condemned already. And no matter how hard you try in this life to find spiritual and emotional rest, you will not find it on your own. To be weary is to work hard to the point of exhaustion. This weariness can come from the natural exhaustion of facing daily life. But it also can come from seeking to please God on our own. We work so hard, we're trying to earn favor with God or curry favor with God so that he'll let us into heaven. How do I know people are weary about this? Because when you talk to people, you ask them if they know for certain if they died today, if they'd go to heaven, and they'd say something like, well, I'm trying. And then you ask them what they tell Christ if, They stood before him, and and, and he asked, why should I let you in? And they say something like, well, you know, I'm good to my neighbors. I've never cheated on my wife. I've loved my kids. Hadn't beat them too much. (laughs) It's all about stuff. It's not about Jesus. And so people are constantly seeking to, to earn favor with God on their own. It is said of the 16th century reformer Martin Luther. At one time, early in his ministry, he was asked if he loved God, and he said, love God, sometimes I hate him. What what Luther was referring to about his relationship with Jesus was before he had a relationship with Jesus, he went through some tough periods in his life where he was seeking 
to earn his salvation on his own. He was plagued with doubt that he might not go to heaven. And he lived in constant fear that Satan was going to get his soul. That Satan was going to tear him out of this life and drag him to hell. And God was going to punish him for his sin. And so he would spend hours every day in the confessional telling another priest or monk about his sin. Nitpicking out every detail of his life. And he would even sleep on a stone slab in his quarters at night without any cushion on top of it as a way of punishing himself. And when it was particularly cold outside, he'd leave the window open so he would freeze at night to punish himself. This is the type of weariness that we're talking about. Seeking to please God on our own brings us to a place of desperation where we don't know how to please God. Where weariness refers to an eternal exhaustion, the idea of being heavy laden refers to an external exhaustion brought about by carrying a heavy weight. So weariness is internal, heavy laden is carrying a heavy weight on the outside. This heavy weight is nothing more than sin. The righteous lives that we seek to live in our lives amount to filthy rags before God. Jesus is calling us to repent of our sin and lay our burdens down, lay our sin on his shoulder. The term is not used repent, but the weary and heavy laden only comes to God when they realize they can no longer do it on their own or continue to do it on their own. And so they come to Jesus in humility as a babe looking for their father to save them from sin. I'm tired. I'm weary. I'm burdened by the cumbersome weight I'm carrying. I'm tired, boss. <laughs> Remember that movie? I'm tired. Jesus says, I know. I know you're tired. But come to me when you're internally exhausted from weariness. Come to me when you're heavy laden with external weariness, and I will give you rest. We must come to a place where we realize in our despair, that we cannot do it on our own. Moses did that in the wilderness. He, he didn't want to do anything from God because he thought he wasn't able. And the truth is, he wasn't. He found out he was nothing without God. We have to be at the end of ourselves. I always say it like this. When you've hit rock bottom, there's only one place to look. And we need to hit rock bottom with our understanding of saving ourselves and, and working ourselves into salvation. Here's the truth. Are you burdened by the sin of the world, the sin of the world in your own life? Are you heavy laden by the cares of the world? Are you discouraged? Are you in despair? My friend, Jesus is your only solution. Not yourself. You're not your own solution. Not your family. Not even the church. Not your pastor. Not your good deeds. All those things are great. We love our church. We love our family. We're even called to love ourselves. We're just not called to love ourselves more than others. All those things are great, but they do not provide real, lasting rest. Jesus calls the lost to come. Jesus calls the weary and heavy laden to come. And thirdly, Jesus gives rest to those who come. The rest that Jesus is talking about here is a refreshing, reviving, down to the very core of the soul. Interestingly enough, the dictionary gives us several definitions of rest 
that remarkably parallel our spiritual rest. I'd like to share those with you. <clears throat> First, the dictionary says that rest is a cessation from action, motion, or activity. So to rest means we stop moving. Similarly, we must cease in all of our own efforts to try to save ourselves or earn our salvation or please God on our own without Him. Secondly, rest is described as a relief from that which wearies or disturbs. We see here that God gives us freedom from the burdens that cause us to be weary, that are causing us distress, that He carries those burdens. He calls us to bring those burdens to Him, and He will give us relief. Third, rest is described as something that is fixed or settled, something that is at rest, something that is fixed or settled. We have assurance that the rest we receive is ordained by the promise of God. Just want to remind you of something. God always keeps his promises. Every single time. God is good all the time, and God always does what he says he's going to do, and so we can rest in God because it's settled. Fourth, rest is described as confidence, confident and trustful, to rest in something because we can trust in it. We know that when God begins a work in us, he will bring it to completion. We know that God will save us if we call upon his name. He said he will, and he'll bring us through to the end. We can be confident and trustful and hopeful and faithful to God because we know he's going to be faithful to us. And finally, the dictionary says rest is leaning or depending on something. My friend, if you don't know by now that you can depend on God, I don't have any help for you. We can rest in Jesus. You say, well, we can't meet together. How am I going to find rest? Well, you don't find rest in your church. You don't find rest in your family. You don't even find rest in a sermon. A sermon can direct you where to find rest, maybe. But your rest comes only in God, and you can rest right where you are in God. Now, don't hear me say that you should get used to meeting in an online format. I don't like it. Not one bit. I want to hear your voices saying amen and see your smiling faces and hear Tom talk. I look forward to it. But my friend, you don't need this building and you don't need another person to find rest because it's only found in Jesus. We don't find rest in our religion. We are only scrambling for perfection when we seek to find rest in religion. You won't find rest in the things of this world. You might enjoy a nice day at the beach or a good day fishing. That might bring you some physical rest, but my friend, that will not provide eternal rest. Why? Because Jesus is the place that we place our confidence and dependence upon. And when we take his yoke upon us, we learn from him. We grow in him. We walk with him. And my friend, he does all the heavy lifting. His yoke is easy and his burden is light because he's doing the lifting. And you will find rest for your soul. Listen, I literally see it every day. Even in this time where I do not get to see people's face, I literally see people struggle every single day. They are struggling to make their world a better place. They're struggling to make their lives a better life. But the problem is that there are so many definitions and plans for how we make the world better that everybody is confused. My friend, the world is broken. 
And there are people out there that tell us we need to fix it. And yes, we need to do our best to make our world better. But my friend, you will never fix this world because sin is what broke it. And only God can fix it when he comes back. You and I are broken. If we can't fix the world, why do we think we can fix ourselves? But listen very carefully. God can fix you. God can set you up and make you right and give you peace and conquer your discouragement, conquer your despair, and give you a sense of peace that surpasses all understanding. My friend, if you're out there today and you've never surrendered your life to Christ, God is calling you, come to me with the burdens of your life and the burdens of your world and the sin in your life and repent of that and lay it down before me and I will give you rest. Believer, he's calling you today. If you are heavy laden and weary from the struggles that you are facing, you've lost your job, you've got a sick relative, you don't know about the future and you are in a moment of anxiety, bring your petitions and your troubles and your despairs and your struggles and everything to the Lord. Lay them on his feet and my friend, his yoke becomes easy and his burden is light. Bring your anger, bring your pride, bring your lack of confidence in yourself whatever your burden bring it to Jesus and he will give you rest I don't know about you but I need rest do you need rest come to me Jesus is saying and I will give you rest father we thank you for your word, for this invitation of Jesus, for the gospel message that says that I don't have to save myself, that you've done everything necessary to provide for my salvation through your death, burial, and resurrection. And Father, help us to learn that as we serve you, Father, as we walk with you, as we carry on our daily lives, that you're the one that can give us rest. And help us, Lord, to know the longer we serve you and the more we place our faith and trust in you, the more rest we will receive. Father, and the sweeter you grow. Father, there are so many that I believe are hurting out there right now. And there are people who are listening to this message that have never surrendered their lives to you. Oh God, do a work in their lives. And oh God, wherever we are, whether we're in a computer room or our living room or laying in our bed, watching on our phones, help us, Lord, to get up and bow on our knees and bring our burdens to you, for you are the only place where we can find rest. Father, we love you. Give us your rest. As we come humbly, in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Just as I am.
If you're listening today and you've never surrendered your life to Christ, I would encourage you to reach out to me. Go to eastnewtonbaptist.com. Uh, go to the staff page and click on my email, and you can get me that way. You can also find me on Facebook, or you can call the church office. Starting uh, tomorrow, we'll be going to regular office hours uh, at the church, so be aware of that. Um, and you can call there and get in touch with me. I'd love to talk to you about your salvation. I'd love to talk to you about what it means to follow Christ and then eventually to get you plugged in so that you can grow in your understanding of what it means to follow Christ. And for those of you that are here today uh, watching, we thank you so much for coming. We, we pray that this, this, uh, this text, this sermon, uh, provided you with some encouragement, with some comfort, and that you've come and laid your burdens on Christ. He's calling you to walk with Him, to have peace with Him, and to give you the abundant life that you've always looked for spiritually. He will help you. Just place your faith in Him. It's so good to see you today. So good to hear all of your comments. And so good that you have joined us in worship. Let us continue worshiping everywhere we go, every day. It's good to see you. Let's sing one more song. How great is our God. How great.